village. <laughs> All righty, welcome back. Y'all are looking beautiful from up here. Please finish up your freestyle cohorting conversations and listen. <laughs> We've got a lot to cover. Uh, first things first, I know there's been some confusion and conversation around the bus and shuttle situation. I'm here to calm that down. Um, so last night, you should have received an email from Hannah or Kevin Bitterman. Check your emails if you haven't. Um, and all of your information is in that email. If you did not receive an email from Kevin Bitterman or Hannah, please see Hannah soon-ish. And Hannah's in the back with a wonderful black hat next to Devin in the orange. Hannah, great. Hannah also, in the last 10 minutes, <laughs> sent eight people an email with the change. I'm going to read those names now so you can make sure you check your email. So Tim Jennings, Chad Peterson, Marcy Krausen, Allison Davis, Jose Gonzalez, Milta Ortiz, Kelsey Tyler, and Sarah Waugh. So for those folks, just make sure you check your email so you can see the latest from Hannah. Cool? All right, so did everyone have a good time on their field trips? <laughs> I know I did, my bus, where's bus D? <laughs> Y'all are so, best bus ever. Uh, but to honor those experiences we just had together, I would love to have a town hall where everybody, everybody shares out their experiences. But we don't really have time for that. So instead, I want to try a town hall that is exactly three seconds long. I want everyone here to share one thing they're going to take away from those field trips, and we're going to share at the exact same time. This will shake off those lunch cobwebs and get us warmed up for our real town hall later with our consultants. <laughs> so <laughs> that's going to be in the last banjo song. Uh, so everyone, quick, 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 take a moment to think about one thing you're going to take away from the field trips. It could be serious or it could be silly, but it shouldn't be more than three seconds. So here we go, our three-second town hall. I'll count down from three, and after I say one, not on one, but after one, you share your field trip takeaway. Ready? Well, it doesn't matter, because here we go. Three, two, one. All right, we're done. Three seconds. Ah, stop. Okay, good. Great. <laughs> Thank you for attending our three-second town hall and for sharing your experiences so freely and, and at the same time. It was wonderful. Uh, we'll just become one big cohort for a moment, and it was a beautiful thing. Uh, in all seriousness, one reason we did these field trips is because too often in our convenings, we try to pack so much stuff in, and we wind up spending so much time in a hotel <laughs> or a conference center that we really n never get a sense of where we are. So we thought that was really important to do in Kansas City. Um, so with our Kansas City info burst and the field trips, we hope that we achieve that goal. And to get a deeper sense of things, I'd love to introduce Jeff Church from Coterie Theater to the stage. Hi, everybody. Uh, Fellow cohorts, I should say, right? Uh, I think you're all Kansas City cohorts now. Can I think of you that way? Uh, we loved having you here. Uh, here's the deal. I, my, my, I was just going to talk to you about where are you. You are across the street from Hallmark's headquarters. And Hallmark is the largest uh, employer of artists, commercial artists, I should say, in the United States or perhaps the world, and it happens to be right here across the street. And the building that you're in, besides being in the Westin, you're in the Crown Center complex. And the Hallmark owns this complex, and in this complex there are three theaters, live theaters. There's the theater that I run with Joette Pelster, the Coterie Theater, which is a multi-generational theater on level one, and then there's um, the m music theater heritage on level three, and then there's a theater, a full 400 seat theater that is dark and is looking for its identity because it, it uh, Hallmark used to own it and run a commercial theater, but then the eco e economic downturn happened and now we have a big empty 400 seat theater. There's an opportunity for somebody out there. Um, please come and join us. Uh, now, uh, across the link, you get over to Union Station. And in Union Station, you have uh, the city stage, and that houses theater for Young America. 
And beside that is the Todd Bollinger Center that you guys, some of you went to on the bus tour, and that's what an exciting place that is. And then you can even take a bridge over the train tracks and get yourself over into the crossroads. And that is the crossroads west, which is like has the fish tank. And you guys all, maybe some of you had David Ford as your host down there, who is a crossroads leader. But there's also crossroads east, which houses the Green Lady Lounge, where some of us were until rather late last night. And then there, but abutting that is the living room theater. Um, and further downtown, of course, is the, the rep second stage in the Power and Light District in, uh, at the Copacan stage. And besides all of that uh, is an area of town called the Bottoms. And some of you went to the shift last night. So that was a wild experience, I bet, for some of you. So that's this lower section. Then as you go up the street, you actually have a, a city-owned theater um, that used to be a barn that burnt down and then somebody had the idea like, let's make a theater that community groups can use. Um, and that houses two professional theaters, Melting Pot and Spinning Tree. And then a little bit further down Main Street, off Main is Paul Mesner's studio, um, the Metropolitan Ensemble Theater, the Unicorn Theater, and then if you go way out, you get Starlight Theater, which is a big outdoor theater that seats 7,000 people. So, um, and of course the, the rep is right there in the UMKC campus, also at the end of the Main Street Corridor. So that's kind of the, where you are in theater. Now where you are is in Missouri. Did some of you think you were coming to Kansas? Some of you did, didn't you? And that makes us cross. Now, I, <laughs> it, we can't, I just like, I'm not even from here, Missouri. I've been here 24 years, but I get cross about it. And I think the reason why we get cross is because we all, a lot of the arts uh, have, have um, the hub is in Missouri, but in Kansas, there's not a lot of arts. There's some arts, but not a lot. And so we get protective, I think. But there is this street that uh, cuts through a large portion of the city and that street is called State Line. And if I drove you in a car, I could be on Missouri, and you in the same car can be in Kansas if I just drove down the middle of the line, which I do to people all the time, and it freaks them out. Um, so anyway, that's, that's okay, where you are. Now I just will say one of the challenges that we have, um, you know, yes, we have a great cost of living, and there's a great art scene here, but we have never really united Kansas and Missouri uh, in, in as a sort of uh, getting the, the, the people in Kansas to think about coming to Kansas City, Missouri, fully as their own arts hub. I mean, that's really been a challenge and it's something we have to solve. Uh, and we've tried to do it in different ways um, and uh, wish us luck on that because the, gr the city's grow going south and they hardly even, you know, sometimes there's people who don't even know of the art scene were not even a blip on their radar. So we have our challenges, but we sure have loved having you and uh, have a great rest of the afternoon. And if you stay tonight, see a play, go to a great restaurant, um, love to talk more to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Now, many of you know Jeff as a, our beloved producing art art artistic director of the Children's Theater Coterie, but he's also directing adult plays, and he's directing Equus at the Living Theater. So if you are staying tonight and not dealing with the bus situation, <laughs> you should go see what you're directing at the Living Theater. So thank you. Now, here we go. Ethan. It is my pleasure to introduce our next plenary speaker to the stage, Ethan Zuckerman. He is the Director of Civic Media at MIT. He is an activist and scholar whose work focuses on the global blogosphere, free expression, and social translation in the developing world. He was a fellow at Harvard University's Berkman Center for Internet and Society, the co-founder of Global Voices, an award-winning international citizen media network, and co-founder of Geek Corps, a nonprofit group that provided technology assistance to governments and companies in the developing world. He was named a global leader for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum. Please join me in introducing Ethan Zuckerman to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dafina. And uh, let me just start by saying you guys are way livelier than the family physicians. <laughs> so, so what Dafina did not mention is that my hobby 
is speaking at conferences where I know absolutely nothing about the subject matter at hand. And, and sometimes this works out really well, but when you go out and hang out with those physicians, they're like, man, like, we didn't invite you, get off the stage, we're calling security. It was, it, it hurt people, it really, it really hurt. But it, it's the advantage behind this is that it forces you to draw connections between something that you actually know a little bit about, which for me is this question of how people around the world try to make change in their societies and tie it into what you're talking about with audience engagement. And so you look at this and you go, this is great. I don't actually have to say anything about the theater. I don't have to say anything about audience engagement, which is good because I don't know anything about it. I'm gonna come and talk about something that I know about. This one's gonna be a layup. And then you realize you've made a terrible, terrible mistake. And the reason for this, and I started thinking about this about two weeks ago, is that this question of engagement, this question of participation, turns out to be pretty much the hardest question in the two fields that I work in. I basically work on two things. I work on this question of social change and politics, and I work on this question of where is the internet and where is this sort of space of participatory media going. And the one problem those two areas have in common that they absolutely have not solved is figuring out how to do participation at scale. And this problem of participation at scale is so hard that even really smart, really powerful people screw it up, like the White House. So we got a call from the White House about two years ago. This doesn't happen even that often over at MIT, but we got a call from the White House because they wanted to do a hackathon. And hackathons are the new hot thing in the tech world. They're basically a way of saying, you know, we're gonna get some geek cred. You know, this is the era of Facebook. We all need geek cred instead of street cred. We're gonna bring in technologists to come take on the problems that we have to deal with. We're gonna sit together in a room for a day or two. We're gonna get new ideas sort of coming out of this. They called us up and said, we're gonna do a civic hackathon. The first one that ever happens at the White House, send us someone good. So I send Catherine. Catherine's one of my best students. She's the grown-up one in that picture. Uh, <laughs> she's amazing. She's a data visualization expert. She now teaches data visualization at Emerson College. She's astounding. We send her off. We have a long conversation. Do you wear jeans because it's a hackathon? Do you wear a suit because it's the White House? She goes. It's great. She comes back, and I say, Catherine, what did you work on? You're at the White House. You're working on cutting-edge technology. You're working on ideas that, that are gonna really be the future of all of this. And she comes back and says, well, this is what I built. I built a map that lets you see where people in the United States signed a petition. So this is a petition about forcing people to have storm cellars. And you'll note that a lot of people signed it from Oklahoma. And I go, wait a second, wait a second. Petitions? That's still a thing? Like, why are we talking about petitions? Petitions is what the White House had you work on because petitions are old, like <laughs> seriously old. Like you go back and there is meaningful history behind petitions. Petitions show up in the Ming Dynasty, round about the 14th century. The emperor, because he doesn't like talking with the little people, has a special secretary. And this special secretary reads the petition you bring to him and figures out whether you are serious enough that you actually get face time with the emperor. And because this is an emperor, remind you, this is the only way that you actually get some of this face time. So, so this is a very deep political system. The, the, the entire English system of jurisprudence is built up around the petition. The Magna Carta, in a very, very real way, is a petition from lords to the king, essentially saying, look, you gotta hear us. We've got some basic rights here that you have to acknowledge. And the petition goes in a lot of different directions. This is basically a petition to stop men from drinking so much coffee because it's screwing up their sex lives, which is sort of wonderful and it's actually totally worth reading. But in seriousness, the, the, the 19th century in England, there's a whole rights movement built around trying to ensure that average people, normal people who can't pay their salaries, can serve in parliament. The charter movement, which is built around 
petitions. The U.S. is built on petitions. We end up declaring independence from England because they won't listen to our damn petitions because this is one of the problems with petitions. No one listens to the damn <laughs> petitions. And so because our petitions keep getting rebuffed, we end up saying, you know what, thank you very much. We're going to move on. We're going to try to do something else. But when the Obama administration decides to announce, you know what, we're going to be open, we're going to be geeky, we're going to be technical, what do they do? They put up a petition site. We, the people, come, a, come along, come petition us, help us figure out what you need as the populace of the United States. Here's the thing. Petitions are not a great solution. They weren't a great solution in the 14th century. They're not a great solution now. But the petition demands a certain amount of respect. And the reason it demands a certain amount of respect is that it's a bad but tolerable solution to a really, really hard problem. And the really, really hard problem is this. <coughs> We've got 300 million people. They've all got opinions. They've all got things they want to do. They have things that they care about. They have things that they want to change out in the world. People want to speak. They want to be heard. And they want what they have to say to matter. And that's what the petition tries to do. The petition tries to create a way for us to speak. It tries to create a way that we can be heard. And it tries to give us this hope that whatever we're asking for here might have some impact out in the world, that what we have to say might matter and might change the world that we live in, in one fashion or another. So the White House does this. They put this up in 2011. A lot of people have used this site. People start showing up in droves to use this site. You've had 350,000 petitions signed up. But I'm going to save you the math here. The average petition gets 63 signatures. And this is the problem with petitions. Petitions are a really good way to scale speech. They are a really bad way to scale listening. And you know what? If you've got 350,000 petitions, you either need that secretary sitting next to the emperor or you need some other solution to the problem. And the solution to the problem that the Obama administration came up with was pretty simple. They said, you know what? You want to prove to us that this is worth listening to? Get 5,000 people who share your opinion. Line 5,000 people up, then we'll listen to you. You get 5,000 signatures on the petition, we then promise you a response. Then this petition comes by, all right? This is the petition to secure resources and funding and begin construction of the Death Star by 2016. Now, I don't know if you've been on the internet, but this is the kind of stuff that goes wild on the internet. People do okay with a petition like this. Signing up 5,000 people for this, that is not a problem. And so what happens is, the White House gives a really good response to this. We get a really great response back. It comes back and says, this is not the petition response you're looking for. <laughs> First of all, as the Obama administration, we are not into blowing up entire planets and committing genocide of entire you know, star systems. And besides that, if we were going to build a planet-sized defense force, would we really build something so vulnerable that Luke Skywalker in a single ship could fly in, shoot down an exhaust vent, and blow the whole thing up? I don't think so. That is not what American taxpayer money is going for. And in the course of reacting the way that you guys are reacting, most of us miss the other thing that the Obama administration did, which is they raised that threshold from 5,000 to 25,000. <laughs> and then they raised it again to 100,000. And that's where it is right now. If you actually want to get a response to your petition, you got to get 100,000 signatures. And at 100,000 signatures, this is no longer something you're doing for fun. If you're putting up a petition, you are starting a movement you are actually trying to build some sort of an organization to get to the point where you can actually find your way to be heard. And people are getting heard. This actually is working. This is actually a really good story. This is a story from the Obama administration about a petition that got 130,000 signatures that ended up supporting the right to unlock your cell phone, which in the grand scheme of things, this, this is not world peace, this is not curing hunger, this is not ending disease, this is not toilets for children, but it's not a bad thing. This is a move in the right direction. Obama's able to say, look, I pushed for this legislation because I saw 
100,000 people getting behind this. This does not happen with every petition. There's a lot of petitions out there that the White House has simply chosen not to respond to. And one of the interesting things is you can sort of break them into two camps. You can either say, this is not the White House's problem. It turns out a lot of other countries petition the White House for change, and the White House sort of goes, hey, man, I'm sorry. Like, we're not going to help you out with that. The other thing is stuff where Obama really doesn't want to say, no, I don't think Israel's an apartheid state. I'm not going to take a stance on that particular one. And that petition's been waiting for an answer for quite some time. The other thing the government can do is they can give you kind of the backwards answer. So this was a really interesting response. This was President Obama coming in and saying, I'm going to respond to all these petitions that I got about gun control, and I'm going to tell you that we are fiercely committed to gun control within the Obama administration until you start reading what the petitions were. And the petitions were telling Obama not to engage with gun control. So this is the moment where 50 people come up to petition you and say, please keep your hands off our guns. And you say, I've heard you. My goal is to take your guns. And however you feel about gun control, this is a weird way to have a petition work out. The whole idea was you were trying to figure out how to have your voice. You were trying to figure out how to have an influence on a big political process. And you end up getting exactly the opposite of what you thought you were looking for. So how is this still a thing? Well, it's still a thing because these three questions, how do we scale speech, how do we scale listening, and how do we scale deliberation, how do we scale actually having a conversation about we as a community or as a city or as a nation, these are three of the hardest problems that anyone ends up facing in a democracy. This is not a problem you face as a monarch. And as a monarch, it's not that you don't have to listen. You actually do have to listen. You had better be listening to your military if you're a monarch. It's a really bad idea to let those guys go off on their own. You definitely want to uh, listen to your commercial elites. That's a good idea. They can you know, essentially make your life very miserable. But the problem with a democracy, the challenge with a democracy, is that you've got to listen to everybody. And everybody has to at least theoretically have that ability to speak the possibility of being heard, and the possibility of what they say mattering. And that turns out to be basically the challenge that the founders take on when they try to found the country. When you come along and you basically say, look, we're going to run this a little differently. You know, rather than having the monarch, rather than having this very small group of powerful people I listen to, we're going to try to set up a system where we listen to everybody. And let's be clear, right? Not everybody. Not those you know, women everybody, not people of color everybody. But you know, we're going to try to get a step further towards everybody in the hopes that we're going to start getting there. And this actually inspires some really radical change. So the first thing that the United States has to do when trying to figure out how are we going to scale these things up is to figure out this question of how do you scale speech. The United States, even in 1776, is really big. Going from Maine to South Carolina, when the technology of the day is a horse, that's big. And that is a really hard area where you can scale a conversation. And so the founders do two things, and they're pretty interesting. The first one is they say, look, we're going to make this a value. It's one of the explicit things we're going to say. We're going to give you the right to speak. We're going to give you the right to assemble in any number of different public places, whether it's the church, whether it's the public square. And we're going to throw the geeks at it. We're going to throw the leading technologies of the time. And this is the alpha geek who's really working on this. Franklin is an interesting dude in like 19 different ways. But the most interesting thing about this dude is that he is involved with the two most lucrative technologies of the time in the late 1700s, which are printing and the post office. So the guy starts his own print shop when he's about 16 years old. This is a great way to make money. And then by age 31, he's the postmaster for Philadelphia, which means he's able to control this whole system, moving information throughout the entire country. For everybody who's laughing about the resemblance, I get it. <laughs> People ask me frequently if I'm cosplaying. I am not, in fact, cosplaying. If I let the glasses down and I put on the vest, it gets really... I'm just into the dude. I'm just into the dude. He's a good man. The crazy thing about Franklin... The crazy thing about Franklin 
is not only is he trying to figure out how to scale up the post, right? And the post is this great way to have people all throughout this nation have a conversation with one another one-on-one. -on -one. He's also trying to scale up something even crazier. He is using the post office to try to connect everyone into a single public sphere. So here's how this works. There are an amazing number of newspapers in early America. There are something like four times as many newspapers being published in America in the 1820s than there are in the British Isles. 50% of households have a subscription to a newspaper. Many, many people are subscribing to many newspapers. They are going back and forth everywhere, and they're a little different from how we think about newspapers. They are a little bit of news, a lot of advertising, a lot of collections of letters and opinion pieces, and a lot of collections of other newspapers. There is no copyright law at this point. So you are getting in, well, there's copyright law, but it's different. It's, it's not the crazy thing that we deal with now. Um, if you are a newspaper editor, you are getting in anywhere from 50 to 200 newspapers every week into your newsroom. And you are functionally cutting and pasting them together and sending them out to your own subscribers. And what Franklin does is he does two things. One, he makes newspapers cheaper than letters. So the little folded paper letter, hey mom, I'm doing fine, glad I went to Philadelphia, Boston was a dump, that's, you know, a buck. Whereas sending her the Philadelphia newspaper is 25 cents. And in fact, this goes, this is such a heavy subsidy that people start writing letters by buying a newspaper, making pinpricks under the words so that you can read the newspaper by holding it up to the light and saying, oh, that's what he's trying to say to me. But he's doing this because this is a way to subsidize a public conversation. He wants everyone to be informed because if we're gonna govern ourselves as citizens, we need to somehow be involved with these conversations on a nationwide scale. And then he goes a step further for the newspapers. The reason the newspapers are subscribing to 200 of these is that they're free. The post office will simply carry newspapers from one newspaper to another because it is in the public good. And this is a way of trying to create a public sphere. It's trying to create a space where we, throughout this vast and completely brand new nation, can say what we have to say, have it picked up by a newspaper so it can theoretically be heard, have it picked up by a network of other newspapers so that we get to the point where it's possible, maybe just possible, to have a nationwide <laughs> conversation. Now look, this works a lot better for some people than others. We have a lot more wealthy and well-educated founders who have influence in these debates, but it's a system that's trying to solve the problem. How do we have that conversation on a national scale? We also have the question of saying, how are we now going to get together and argue and deliberate and discuss about this? And here, we have the problem of representation. We all know we're represented by senators, aren't very many of them, two per state, and we're represented by representatives. And those representatives scale with population. And this is a big deal when the founders sit down to write the Constitution. George Washington, after chasing off the British, basically says nothing about governing the country. He sort of knows he's gonna get elected, he's gonna be the first president, he doesn't really want to express an opinion. The one thing he gets involved with, the one place where we know he stands up and says, this is an issue, is when the framers of the Constitution say, I want a representative for every 40,000 people. And Washington says, no, 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 30,000. We gotta think small. This person is your voice in deliberations. The whole genius of American democracy is that you're gonna have a personal relationship with someone who's gonna represent you. They're not always gonna do what you ask them to do. They're gonna go in, they're gonna have an argument, they're gonna have a conversation, it's gonna get riled up at a certain point, and they may change their minds. This whole notion of like voting out politicians because they flip-flop, that's like 180 from how we founded the nation. The whole idea was you wanted to elect someone who could be in that conversation and who you would be able to have a real relationship with in your community, someone you knew, someone you felt you could petition to so they could represent you in those sorts of deliberations. So here's where we are 200 years ago, 1815, 
15 states. Ohio's just come on board. We just kicked out the British the second time in the War of 1812. We've got a really nice functional public sphere. It's a sphere of letters. It's a sphere of the press. We have basic representative democracy. We're represented at a ratio of about 40, 35,000 to one by 65 representatives. What happens in 200 years? A lot, right? We get a lot bigger. We get a lot more populous. We get way, way more diverse. And we end up with some really interesting and really complicated technology changes. We move into what people now call broadcast democracy. And broadcast democracy is a world in which we're no longer working nearly as well to scale speech. We're mostly working to scale listening. Because here's what happens. As big newspapers come online and start making money, as radio comes online, as television comes online, that ability to share your opinion, to share your perspective, that gets way the heck more concentrated. You suddenly have a much, much smaller group of people, political elites, the wealthy, increasingly corporations, who have access to those means of communication. And those means of communication scale listening really well. It's really hard to avoid listening when you've got three television stations. But they don't scale speech well at all. And at the same time, we deal with another scaling problem. We realize that if we keep up with this 30,000 thing, there's no conceivable way we can have representation in Congress. We would be up to 10,000 people in the House of Representatives, which would be really interesting because it would probably force us to actually figure out how 10,000 people have a conversation, which is not a problem anyone has really figured out how to solve. But we throw our hands up and we basically say, you know what, let's stick with the ratio, 700,000 to one. And what this means is that you no longer have any believable chance that that person representing you in the deliberations is someone who you know, someone who understands you, someone who comes from the same background that you come from, and this starts leading to mistrust. It starts leading to a professional political class, a real break between people, and a real sense that people can't have their voice make an impact. So what do people do? They hack. They try to come up with new technologies to solve it. The 1920s, the progressives, they come in and they say, guys, this is not the way it's supposed to be. We gotta give you that ability to make impact. We wanna hear your voice. We want you to be able to make change. We're gonna change everything. We're gonna put up ballot referenda. You can vote directly on things. If you live in California, you suddenly have to read through 40 of these. This is the 1920s solution to this. This is the 1920s coming in and essentially saying, we know we've got a problem. We know that we're not listening. We know that we're not deliberating. How do we bring it back to the people? And this changes a lot of things. Once you're asking people to vote on issues at the statewide level, you've gotta expect them to be informed. You've gotta expect them to be reading newspapers. The news changes in the 1920s. You get investigative journalism, you get muckraking, you get the secret ballot. Prohibition comes at this same period because right now everyone's getting people out to the polls by offering them rum. And prohibition comes in and essentially says, whoa, 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 wait. Citizenship is a serious thing. We should not be getting drunk while we're doing it. Let's shut down the bars. What happens with all of this? We'd like you to stop drinking, read newspapers, and vote on ballot questions. Voter participation drops from 75% to 30%. And we've never gotten it back. We've never come back from this. We ask people to step up and sort of scale participation. And most people sort of go, man, that is really hard. And it is really hard. It's really hard to get across. And so you have other people trying to figure out how to hack this, right? Political polling, probably the most loathed technology in the world. This is actually a technology trying to solve this problem. George Gallup, when he starts going around and saying, what do you think, what do you think? He's trying to figure out how do we do better representation than electing people every two years. If we could ask a set of people every week or so, what do you think on this issue? Where do we think we're going? We would have better participation. We would be in better shape to deal with this scaling problem. We've been hacking on this problem for 200 years. And 20 years ago, this new technology comes around. We move from broadcast democracy into the internet and everything changes. And everything changes because as soon as you move into this new paradigm of the internet, people wanna participate, they can. And if you do not take them seriously, 
they will bankrupt you. And I say this from personal experience. In 1996, I'm the CTO of this company, tripod.com. I'm hiding in the back. I had more hair, but not that much more hair. We are a tiny little startup, even before tiny little startups become cool. This is like 96, people don't actually sort of understand this whole net thing. We're hanging out in the house and we are publishing a magazine. But it's an internet magazine, so it's super exciting. We're all just out of college. Our, our magazine is called Tools for Life. It's gonna help you figure out how do you go out in the world and get a job and invest and meet somebody and have the best life you can possibly have. And in the background, like late one night at 2 a.m., one of my programmers writes a little tool. And this is called a homepage builder. And it lets you put up your own homepage on the web. And these things are awful. They're hideous. They're ugly as hell. People don't know what they're doing. They make these ugly, miserable things. And, and so we just let people start putting up their own homepages. And then I get the bill. I get my monthly internet hosting bill and it is 20 times what it was the month before. It is more than it is in our bank accounts. It is more than it is in our investors' bank accounts. I have just lost the company because our users love this stuff so much more than the content that we are working very, very hard to give them that they are going to very quickly put them out of business unless we can figure out how to make this our business. So we have to look at all of those nice, smart, you know, smiling people who all see this as a step to the New Yorker and we're gonna write this online magazine, we're gonna get real jobs out in the world and basically tell them, you know what? No one cares what you're writing. They wanna write. And even if it looks like Dragon Slayer's extended page, this is where our business is going. And so we finally come up with a term for it, we call it user-generated content, which is a very polite way to sort of say, you don't wanna listen to me you want to speak, and that's what the internet is all about. It's all about trying to figure out how people can speak, how you can scale speech. And the internet has scaled speech more than any technology we have ever seen in history. Suddenly it's become possible, even whether you think of it or not, anyone who's tweeting this, that's speech at scale. Anyone who is putting this up on Facebook, anyone who's Instagramming, all of these things are speech acts going and putting things out into the world. And this has become the new way that economics in this space happens. What happens when you do it? You suddenly have a surplus of one thing, and when you have a surplus of one thing, you end up with a scarcity of another thing. Herbert Simon comes up with this formulation in 1971. He basically says, look, when we suddenly have a whole lot of information, something is gonna be scarce. And the thing that's gonna be scarce is attention. Suddenly that everyone can ask for our attention and we're suddenly going to find that this is our most precious commodity. Now Simon, by the way, is not reacting to the internet. He's reacting to the Xerox machine. He is freaked out about the fact that as an academic, now everybody is going to be able to send him drafts of what they're writing and hand it to him, and he's gonna have to read it. And he's losing his shit because he realizes there's no way that I can do all of this. But now we look at the internet and we realize this is exactly where we live. We are all perpetually battling each other for attention. We're trying to get attention from everything else that's on the stream. We're battling with the advertisers who are also looking for the attention. We're battling for any activist out there who wants to say, look, this is now what you have to pay attention to. We're battling the White House. Obama is going out and trying to use these things as well because he also needs attention. And then when people actually find a way to come grab a lot of our attention, like folks like Cutoni 2012, we end up feeling sort of cheated. We end up feeling like someone hacked this. Like it shouldn't be that easy. There's no way that these guys who are running a somewhat shady operation should suddenly be what everyone is talking about. This just feels wrong. And so people start reacting to this condition and saying, we've got information overload. We've got no way to handle all the people asking us for information. Other people look at this and say, no, 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 it's filter failure. If you just had better tools, if you could just get exactly what you wanted, then you wouldn't feel overloaded. The problem with that is that we do have those tools and you can hear exactly what you wanna hear because the internet has gotten very, very good at building filters. And if you only wanna hear from New England academics, there are websites you can go to and hear from nothing but New England academics. And that's bad for us, for a nation as well. 
in the same way that we tried to build a nation that made it possible to have that argument between Massachusetts and South Carolina, we need to find a way to have an argument that's global in scale so that we're actually thinking about all of these things. I wrote a book on this. You can read it if you want. I'm not actually going to talk about it because I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about this question of how we deliberate, how we not only figure out how to speak and how to hear, but how we decide. And this is a place where we've also fallen down. The best examples within this are outside the United States. This is Brazil. This is a movement called Marco Seville, the Internet. This is a bunch of Brazilians getting together and saying, you know what? We don't trust any of you guys. We're going to pass our own Internet legislation. We're going to write it ourselves online. More than 1,200 people come together. They write this bill. They get it passed. Brazil now has some of the best legislation to protect the Internet that exists anywhere else in the world. You've got cities like Reykjavik essentially saying, look, we need every citizen to tell us what we should be doing. Make a better Reykjavik. Tell us how to participate within this. We have comparatively little of this in the United States. We have comparatively little of this because we have never solved this representation problem. We've still got this very small group of people. And it's really not very easy to get that job anymore. And when you get that job and you are now a new elected representative, this is what the Democratic National Committee tells you you should do. This is how you should manage your time. Four hours a day should be spent raising money. That's what call time means. That means working for your reelection from the day you got into office, half of your office hours. You might spend two hours doing what we think of as congressional work, actually being out there and on the floor, and you might have a chance to talk to some of your constituents for an hour or two a day. We have hit a system that does not scale. And people try to fix it by trying to figure out, can we influence these big guys, the big presidential candidates? Dean is up there not just because I love the screen, but Dean actually tried to do something very different. He said, look, I'm going to ask people who support me to help write my platform. Go online, write a blog, tell me about it. We're going to read this, we're going to contemplate, we're going to deliberate from this. We're going to figure out what it means to be a progressive candidate in the United States right now. He gets knocked out four years later, and suddenly we have Obama doing something very, very different. Obama doesn't announce that he wants to hear how we should govern. He wants you to help figure out how we promote. And this is what we get in 2008 and 2012. And this is not just a Democrat thing. The Republicans do this as well. But we move from this moment of sort of thinking, maybe we're actually going to have a highly participatory, highly deliberative presidential contest to one which is basically distributed marketing. What we have been facing in the United States since the late 1950s is a long-scale decline in trust. This is a graph of what happens when George Gallup goes out and asks people, do you have a lot or some faith in government? And under Eisenhower, you'll see it's round about 70%, goes down under that Nixon guy, goes down again under Carter, comes back a little bit under Reagan, we get it back up again after we invade Iraq. That's always a good thing. Invade a country, that brings the confidence up. It's been down in the teens for a very, very long time. And it's not just the government. It's any big institution. People feel like in a world where there's so many different tools that we can use to speak, if they don't get heard, they stop trusting those systems. If they can speak, but they cannot influence and affect those systems, what goes away is trust. And what you start ending up with is revolution. And revolution's a lot of fun to talk about when we've got clash on the sound system, we're thinking about revolution, but revolution is really, really messy. Revolution is something that makes sense when you're in Tunisia and you've had the same guy in power for 32 years. But revolution is not necessarily the way you want to govern most countries. And you know what? Revolution isn't even what it was cracked up to be. This is my buddy Zainab Tufeshi. She is the smartest person about trying to figure out how political change in closed societies happens. And she's, by the way, in full sociologist gear. If you study protests and you are a smart sociologist, you wear a helmet 
because the way that the tear gas gets you is not breathing it, it's when the canister hits you in the head. So this is the preferred way to go out. So she's finishing up a book on what happened in Gezi Park. And what's amazing with Gezi Park is Turks of every different stripe come out to protest. You have people all in black, they are hardcore Islamists, you have the communists, you've got the left, you've got some ultranationalists out there, you've got the gay and lesbian movement. These guys come out because the motto of Gezi Park is send to gel. You come too. Whatever you're pissed off about, you come out, we'll have a movement, jointly we're going to figure out how to change Turkey. And this is a great message to get people out into the streets. Twitter is a great tool to get people out in the streets. Social media is a great tool to mobilize but it is crap at governing. These people can't deliberate, they can't talk to one another, they don't do what protesters did 20 or 30 years ago, which is work out their differences before they all come into the square. Instead, we use media to draw everybody out, and then everyone decides what to do, and they can't get along. And this revolution falls apart almost overnight. And we're seeing this again and again, we're seeing people do a better job of leading people to protest, but not figure out how to figure out how an effect on society. So what do you do? What do you do when people feel disempowered and they feel ineffective? People are starting to find other ways to make change. My friends who are pissed off about the NSA reading their email, they're not trying to pass laws about surveillance because they don't think it's gonna happen and they're probably right. But what they're doing is trying to write code to make it really, really hard for anybody to read their email. And over time, they may be able to pull it off. People who are really frustrated about climate change are trying to figure out how do you fix this in the market. And whether it's the Tesla or the Prius, these are people trying to go out and essentially say, can I find a way to deal with the fact that we cannot get this government to do something meaningful about climate change? Can I make change out there in the market? But you may be looking at this and saying, okay, I am not a computer hacker, nor am I a rogue billionaire like Peter Thiel. What do I do? And the answer for most people is that you make media. This is where we're seeing a lot of people trying to make political change. So let me try to explain this. This is an internet meme that gets a lot of traction shortly after Michael Brown is killed in Ferguson. And you start seeing a lot of these pairs of images. And the idea behind these images is to ask the question of how black people who are victims of violence end up being portrayed by the media. Because when a young black man gets gunned down, the first thing the media does is finds him on Facebook and finds the image that is going to be his portrayal in death. And what people end up saying is that how Michael Brown was portrayed shortly after the shooting was not a particularly fair portrayal. Most newspapers ran that image on the left, and Michael Brown is flashing a peace sign, which is usually reported as flashing a gang sign. He's shot from the bottom. We've got photographers here. You know that that's a way to make someone look taller and more menacing. You have a photo in the same Facebook stream from the same period of time with this pudgy looking kid with the phones on that no one is running. They are running the one on the left as a way, consciously or unconsciously, of enforcing the idea that this is a young black man who is a threat. And so you have folks like this gentleman who is a 19-year-old active duty Marine come in and say, look, I looked in my photo stream and you got both of these photos. And if I got gunned down, which one do you think they would use? And you see a whole movement of people trying to find a way to participate within this. And by the way, not an easy, not a contested movement you end up with a lot of white kids coming in and saying, yeah, I look pretty bad too on my Facebook, and people going, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not what this conversation is about. Now, is this activism? Is this slacktivism, as my friend Evgeny Morozov likes to talk about? Yeah, it's easy for people to do. This is what people do. We make media and we put it out in the world, but this can matter. This ends up in the New York Times. They end up talking about it. There is not an editor in the country who doesn't have a conversation about this in their newsroom, to try to figure out this question of are we inadvertently reinforcing some of the norms that lie behind what happened to Michael Brown? 
there are ways to make change through making media and through making digital media. The Human Rights Campaign did this. When Human Rights Campaign decided that they wanted to rally energy for the Equal Marriage Campaign, they invited people not only to change the Facebook icon to the pink equal sign, but to remix it and to have fun with it and to play with it. And in aggregate, this starts having an interesting effect. You go on Facebook shortly before the marriage equality decision, you may not have a sense for which of your family and friends support marriage equality, and you may be surprised. You may find that there's a seismic shift going on in the United States, which a lot of people were surprised by, where over the course of about 20 years, we built a majority in support of equal marriage, which most people didn't know. You can even use petitions. And this is a petition that has a lot to do with why George Zimmerman ultimately gets arrested, because this becomes the rallying point where people can participate and say, I am pissed off about this. I want something that I can do that is more constructive than being angry. I want to raise my voice, and I want to find a way to make it happen. We have to give people these channels. We have to give people ways to do this. Because when we don't, really bad things happen. In Boston, after the marathon bombings, the city of Boston comes together and comes together fast. Within six hours, the Red Cross of Boston makes the following announcement. Thank you very much. We have more blood than we can handle for the next two months. Please stop donating. Second, we have more money than we can handle for the next year. Please stop donating. Now, I know that almost all of us are fundraisers here. I cannot imagine a situation in which an NGO says, please stop donating. Red Cross says, please stop donating. People want to participate. They want to do something. And so a lot of these people hanging out on the website Reddit say, look, maybe we can help the cop. Let's look at some of the images. Let's see if we can figure out what comes out there. And they come up with a theory who's really done the Boston bombing. They identify this kid, Sunil Trapani. Sunil had disappeared from Brown University a couple of months before. The theory emerges that he has disappeared to become the bomber. People start calling his family and showing up on their doorstep. They have a Facebook page asking where their missing child is. They have to say, this is not Sunil. I can't believe you're coming to this conclusion. And it's not Sunil. Turns out they just flat out got it wrong. Turns out, five days later, Trapani shows up dead, suicide, in Providence. Killed himself, in part because he's been hounded by what ends up being a gang online. These are not necessarily bad people. These are people who want a moment to participate. They can't find it. They can't find the right way to do it. And what the internet is remarkably good at letting us do right now is bringing people together and trying to have an impact on the world. And we have to get a lot better at it because it is a real power. So here's why I'm hopeful. I get to do a lot of work in the developing world. I do a lot of work in Sub-Saharan Africa. I do a lot of work in Kenya. And Kenya had a really bad election in 2007. The guy in power decided to stay in power despite the will of the majority. You ended up with rioting in the streets. One of the nicest, most stablest countries on the continent suddenly is a big mess. Friends of mine, good friends of mine, are media makers. They're bloggers, they're political commentators, and they look at this and they say, look, this is not okay. We've gotta figure out how to document what's actually going on in our country. We have to figure out the bad and the good. We have to find a way to come together and talk about it. And they build this new product. It's called Ushahidi, Witness. And it's really simple. What it lets you do is either from a mobile phone or from a web browser, you can make a report. You can say, here's what's going on in my community. Right now, someone burned down my shop. Or right now, someone from a different ethnic group brought a family that was under threat into their house. Someone was trying to make conflict. Someone was trying to make peace. And we end up with accounts, thousands of accounts from all over the nation painting a really rich story of what's going on, giving a real sense of what's happening to Kenya in early 2008. This turns out to be a really helpful thing to do. It's so helpful that we put the software out, we put it out on the market, and people start using it for other reasons. They start using it in Haiti after the earthquakes so that people can come together and say, 
here's what happened, here's who needs help. This becomes Katie's 911 system for people using their mobile phones to say, here's where I am, here's where I need help, here's a map of the destruction in Port of Prince, and here's the blueprint that we use to solve it. So I've had the good fortune to work with these amazing Kenyans since 2008, and I found myself looking at this and saying, I want to do something. I want to do something around this power to participate online. And here are my assumptions. I'm going to assume that people are going to make media. I'm going to assume that they're not going to trust the government. I'm going to assume that they want to see the influence that they can have in the world. And I'm going to assume that if we can put a lot of people together, we can make some real change. And so I went to Sao Paulo. And I went to Sao Paulo because of these two guys on the left. The mayor of Sao Paulo does something crazy when he gets elected. He says, here is a 300-page book of 120 promises I am making to the people of this city. And if I don't live up to them, get rid of me. You know, don't elect me in four years. And he does it because this guy in the middle, Oded Greju, says, you know what? We're going to hold you to it. I have the largest group of community organizations, neighborhood organizations, and we're going to watch you like a hawk and we're going to see whether you live up to this or not. And Oded calls me up and says, we haven't figured out how we're going to watch him. Can you help? And I said, yeah, we do that. So we've been going out and building this piece of software called Promise Tracker. And Promise Tracker lets you sit down with a group of people and say, this is what I care about in my community. I'm a father. I've got a five-year-old. I spend a lot of time thinking about playgrounds. I really want my kid to have a place to play. And I can now make an app that lets me go out into the community and make a map of the playgrounds. Are they any good? Are they dangerous? Are they safe? Are they working? Do they need maintenance? And I can recruit my friends to come help me map that. And we can put that map online. We can make a visualization of it. We can invite other people to come and find a solution to those problems. And it doesn't have to be playgrounds. It can be bike lanes. It can be any different way of doing things. It's a platform to let people find what they're passionate about, what they care about, and try to find the solutions. And Brazil is the most amazing place in the world to do this because you have almost no trust in government and incredible creativity. And you'll see people coming out and essentially saying, here's what I want to solve. These folks, the garbage pickers, they're the people who actually keep the streets of Brazil clean. We have this tendency to run them over with our cars. We should really do something about that. I'm going to raise $30,000 online to pimp my carroza, to help people go out and try to figure out how to paint these carts so that these guys are visible and they're respected and they're a clear part of the community. And you'll see slogans that say things like, my work's honest is yours. Or, if it were up to me, I would recycle the politicians. If you want people to engage, you got to figure these three things out. You got to figure out how you help people speak. You got to figure out how they can be heard. And you have to figure out how they have impact. Because if you don't get that last one right, people figure out very quickly that the controls aren't connected to anybody. When you have speech, it gets harder to listen. It gets even harder to deliberate. And when we have more speech and no way to have impact, we may actually end up with more mistrust. And so what we got to do is we've got to expect that people are going to make media. We got to figure out how that mistrust, that mistrust of institutions, turns into an asset for making change. It is our most renewable asset. We got to help people figure out how they can come together and move the needle. And I thank you guys for listening to me. Hello. So we want to make some space if there are a couple of urgent questions that you want to ask Ethan while he's here. So if there's some questions, there's a couple of mics in the house. I, I got an urgent question. Can someone throw me a bottle of water? Water. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Questions. You've got mics. You can speak. We will hear you. It is scalable. Make time for the water. <laughs> but if we're going to do it, you have to stand up and do it. 
because otherwise we're going to go on because there's other wonderful things on the program. All right, here we go. Participation. Hands up for participation. I'm going to be really specific, and I totally think you can help me. Uh, Jason Rezaian, journalist in Iran, in jail, longest American journalist held. I decided to make a campaign, a poster campaign, where people would make a burrito that he loved that I made and have dinners all through the country. We have around 200 people that have already done it, but it's uh, the uh, Muhammad Ali, the national press, all talked about him, but it's been silent. Yeah. Yeah. Silent. Yeah. He's been there for 200 and almost 60 days, and no one in America knows that he's there. And I don't know, I, yeah. I'm like doing that thing of what did I do wrong? How did I fuck up on Twitter? Instead yeah, yeah. of like, I'm not Kim Kardashian and breaking Twitter, I'm breaking it the wrong way. And so it's like, I don't know if everyone feels this way, but there's sometimes there's campaigns or yep. things you feel that good about that fail. Yeah. And what do you? I, I, so first of all, I, I don't think you fail. Like, I think you've got a lot of people behind it. The question on any of these campaigns is, is what's the theory of change behind mm -hmm. it, right? So who has the power to help get your friend released? And what's really, really hard when you've got friends in prison, we're dealing with three of our colleagues in Ethiopia in prison right now, is that you don't have a lot of influence on the people who are actually making those decisions. So you're going really indirectly, but you're probably affecting 20 or 30 people, and they're people within the State Department. And so you need an inside and outside strategy. You need a way to be talking to them on the inside, and then you need a way to show the pressure on the outside. When you've got someone who's in prison, you start using anniversaries. You start looking for different creative ways to do it. You try to keep the pressure up. But that visibility, that isn't the real theory of change. The theory of change is who are you talking about inside? Where can they make the pressure? How do they sort of push on it? And how do you use that sort of externality to put the pressure internally within it? But you're right in the broader sense, which is we fail a lot. Mm -hmm. And trying to figure out how to mobilize is a great unsolved problem. And one of the things to do on this is we gotta keep iterating, we gotta keep trying. One of the things that we know that works is novelty. You know, so organizing dinners is a very different way of doing this. You might wanna take a look at, at Conflict Kitchen in Pittsburgh, uh, mm -hmm. which has been running along this wonderful model of essentially saying, can we start understanding places better by trying to figure out how to understand their food? you might be wanting to reach out to journalists in Iran or in the Iranian diaspora, people who are out talking about the situation in the country. Why is this so threatening? Why is this happening? What's that person going through? You know, keep, keep turning the crank and keep looking for the inside and the outside on that. Cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so look, I, I, please. No, I'm just running the mic. If anybody else has questions. <laughs> You're running the mic. I'm running guys, the mic. I'm around. I would love to talk more. I'm hanging out the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. You guys are wonderful. <laughs> really love to be with you. Who's going first? Me? Okay, me. Hi. Great. I loved your speech. I loved the images that you chose. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you could tell me, what is a good request for speech? So you're giving people a way to be heard. Like, um, if you can help me think of, I'm actually thinking, I have a member of a group called the Kilroys that um, is advocating for um, <laughs> production of plays by women, and we're gearing up towards um, uh, the second year of a big project that we did called The List, which is a list of fantastic new plays by women that we're trying to get theaters to produce. And so we want people to share that list broad and yeah. wide and add to it. Um, what is, uh, can you give me an example of a great, of a good targeted request for speech that people will do and use and act on in order to get that out there? So, well, I mean, first of all, I, you're part of the way there, right? So, so one of the biggest things, again, is, is we're looking for participation. Yeah. We're looking for how to sort of value participation. So the bad campaign is the one that, that starts with shame, right? And sort uh -huh. of says, hey, you, you haven't put on a play by a woman playwright in the last 10 years, to hell with you guys. Because, you know, those work, they go fast, but they don't feel good. You, you end up feeling bad about it at the end of it. You know, the one that's better is to sort of say, who do we want to see on stage? What are great women playwrights? What are great works that we want to see? Help build the list, help us figure out where it goes. And then one of the things to do is to try the affirmative piece of it. 
name and fame works really well on that. So reach out to other theaters who are within that who are doing a great job of putting amazing women's works up there and call them out for that. You know, hats off to these folks. Here are some amazing works that have come out of that. Yeah. A friend of mine in Kenya was just telling me that she ended up doing this campaign where she tried to evaluate the best parliamentarian in the country uh -huh. and gave that person a bottle of wine. <laughs> and it was a, a total of a $20 investment, but it was the single most successful campaign they did. People love to win. They love to be awarded. Mm -hmm. And so if you can find some way to do the affirmative mm -hmm. as well as the negative, let people identify who are the people in their communities who are doing really well on this. Have that built into the list. Name and fame as well as name and shame on that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm really not trying to sneak off stage. I'm just cognizant of the fact that I've taken way more time than you expected. Okay. Um, I'm curious. You know, it, it's been, I think, since I guess the iPhone came out in 2007, and there's like a million apps that exist or more. And I've heard that in the last two years, more content has been generated than in our entire history. Um, what do you must, all, all of these things have a developmental phase that certain people know about. You know, there's something happening in the workshops, there's research taking place. What do you know? about what's coming next? I mean, how yeah. long are we gonna be in this period in the history of humankind? So and when yep. are we moving to something else? And what is it? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can tell you what's coming next, and I can tell you that it scares the pants off of me, which is the thing about this social media world that we're in right now is that it's public, right? You know. You guys have reactions, maybe they're positive, maybe they're negative, they're on Twitter, I'm gonna search for my handle and I'm gonna find out how I did. That's going away. What's happening on the cutting edge of all of this is ephemeral media, highly private media, media within very tight, very closed groups. We see some of this and we look at things like Yik Yak and we sort of go, yeah, yeah, it's just the kids. That isn't the scary stuff, not the anonymous stuff. The scary stuff is the stuff you never see. And some of it's happening for really good reasons. My activist friends, they are on secret lists. You're not gonna see them. But that's where a lot of political discourse is going. And so this space, which was working as a public, it was giving us a chance, whether we were hanging out with a lot of black friends, to see Black Lives Matter come across as a wave through it, that's going away. Because that's going into those little micro communities and those micro publics. And this is a moment where those of us who work on shaping technology, we actually have a civic responsibility to sort of come out and say, I know this is what people want, I know this is what sells, and it's really bad for us, and I don't wanna see it happen. But that's where I fear we're going, and that's what a lot of us are trying to figure out, how to make sure that with all these problems, all these problems of participation, we don't lose the possibility of this being one of the most interesting public spheres we've ever had. And on that note. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you, Ethan. Uh, I think we all picked up so much that we can apply in our own